Welcome back to SEO Foundations. In this video, we're going to cover on-page optimization. There are hundreds of signals that are used by the search engines to determine the best search results for any given query. Generally speaking, these signals can be categorized into two broad categories, relevancy and popularity. In this lesson, we will be discussing on-page signals or signals related to relevancy. These signals tell users and search engines what a given website is about. Describe the two broad categories of ranking signals. Recite best practices for on-page signals such as title tags, header tags, URLs, alt text, and others. List and describe on-page SEO tactics that you should avoid. Describe how natural language processing aims to understand the meaning behind text. Search engine optimization is very, very complex. So when you're trying to understand it for the first time, I find it's very easy and best to just break it into general concepts that you already have some understanding of. So when I look at the hundreds of, con uh, hundreds of signals that go into SEO, I break all of them up into either relevancy and or, because sometimes it's both, popularity. So relevancy, popularity. Out of all these signals, they fit into one of these two things. Throughout the rest of this chapter in this course, we're going to break all the signals we have into these two areas so that you can rely on what you already know about the concept of relevancy and the concept of popularity to have some kind of anchor point for these new, brand, these new ideas. In this section, we're going to talk about the on-page factors, and I'll tell you right up front that these are going to become your favorite. These are the ones that you have the most impact on and that you can make a small tweak and have a gigantic impact on the amount of organic traffic that you send. Start with one of my favorites, title tags. Title tags are the single most important on-page metric that we have access to. This is text that we get to express, that we get to write, that shows the intent and the purpose of that page on the internet. This is really, really important because search engines use this, this text that we get to provide, in their search results directly. So we get to write what becomes the headline of the search result itself. This, uh, in addition to uh, the meta description, as we'll cover next, are the two factors that we have a whole lot of control over that influence both click-through rates and people's first impressions of our brand. Next up, we have meta descriptions. Now, meta descriptions are a little bit confusing because it is text that we get to provide to search engines, but more often than not, they override what we provide and try to choose something that is better in their opinion. Now, I go both ways with this. Sometimes it really is better. Most of the time, though, in my opinion, it's not. Uh, but the important thing here is that we get to provide what would normally we'd have to pay for with ad copy. We get to provide it for free, customize it to however we want to entice, to entice clicks, and the search engines are happy to promote that and show that in the search results. All right, now we're getting to the good nerdy stuff, the header tags. So this was something that was built into HTML when the web was first created. Uh, the idea here is that you're establishing a hierarchy. So you start with one H1. Uh, saying what the main purpose of the page is, and you start to break it into subcategories. So you'll have multiple H2s below that, multiple H3s between all of that. Now, H1s used to be a very important and primary SEO metric that we got to use, but because it got abused, it now has less of an importance than it used to. So it shows what information is less or more important than other information on the page, but it is no longer the strongest indicator of what is the most important page on that. And right now, that's still title tags. Next up, we have URLs, Uniform Resource Locators. Now, these are the addresses of web documents online. Just like you have a street address for your house, on the internet we have URLs for any given document anywhere. It could be PDFs, it could be images, it could be text, it could be your homepage. All of these have URLs. These are extremely important for SEO for a variety of reasons. The most important, though, is your keyword usage. You want to make sure that the words that you're trying to rank for are included in your URLs. The second part of this ties in directly to the first is you want to keep these short. So it's not okay to just put a whole lot of words you want to rank for in your URL. You need to remember that humans are the people, are the things that use the internet. They share URLs, they try to say them over the phone, they do all these different things where it becomes extremely important to keep these short and succinct so that people can easily share them and can type them in their browser without any issues. Now that we've talked about the importance of URLs, let's talk about URL structure. Let's dive in a little bit here. We'll start with domain names. So you've probably heard of this concept before. In the example with the URL I have here, example.com would be the domain name. So this is the first thing that people see with your online business. This is what's going to be in all your advertisements. It's going to be in all your marketing efforts. It's this name right here. I like to think of it in terms of an offline world. So if you're walking around, buildings typically look like something. So a barbershop almost always looks like a barbershop. A fast food restaurant almost always looks like a fast food restaurant. That same idea is going to apply to domain names. 
If you have a very spammy looking domain name or one that's hard to spell or one that's confusing, people are going to make an initial impression off of that. So make sure that you have something there that's going to make a great first impression. It'd be something that's easy to spell. That one, especially in this new tech, uh, like tech craziness that we live in, people do a terrible job of that. But it's something that's easy to spell and something that's easy to pronounce and easy to share. So how is this important to SEO? Well, keywords is, are why it's important to SEO. This comes up all the time. It's important to have keywords in your domain name as long as you're not taking it too far. Now, this is one of the things I go back and forth with people all the time. How do you know if you've gone too far? Uh, I don't know. I mean, if it looks like you bought the domain name simply because it has the keywords in it that you needed, then you've probably gone too far. But is that the best way of measuring it? Can I take out my calculator and, and actually calculate that? No, you're just going to have to use your gut. You're going to have to look at it from a, human, from a human perspective. So do not go overboard. Keep it as short as possible. Make sure it's something that you can easily share, something you're going to be able to put on your business cards and be proud of, not something that you bought because you're doing it purely for SEO reasons and you think you're going to succeed. Okay, so that is the domain name. Now what about everything after that? So in this case, it would be this blog post that I wrote. Well, that is called a subdirectories. And you can actually have, um, in theory, unlimited subdirectories. <laughs> but from an SEO perspective, you do not want to do that. And it's for all the reasons we've talked about before. If you have lots of subdirectories, it's going to be confusing. It's going to be hard to share. Uh, it's going to cause lots of problems in older browsers. So your best practice here is to keep as few subdirectories as possible. This will be good for both robots and for human beings. With the subdirectories as well as the files that come after them, you want to make sure you include your keywords. So again, this is one of those weird things where there's not a, a quantified metric for it, but don't put the keywords in there too many times, but put them in there just as, as many times as you think is absolutely necessary. So generally this is once or maybe twice if it's already in the domain name. Okay, that's all the information I have right now on URLs. Feel free to uh, Google this subject if you, if you want to know more about it, because trust me, there's a whole lot of technical knowledge that goes in this. But if you're at this point, you already understand all the most important parts of it. As you likely realize, computers cannot see images the same way that humans can. Uh, they do not have eyes, and they do not have the complex brains that we use to get meaning out of pictures, out of pixels. So because of that, we've had to come up with some other way of expressing the meaning behind images. Luckily, the creators of the internet were forward thinking and they provided us with a factor called image alt text. Alt text is the alternative text that is shown when an image can't load. This is done on purpose so that people who are blind are able to extract meaning from something when they can't see it. This worked out really well for search engines because, well, they're effectively, bl effectively blind and so that they can also use that information put into the image alt text to understand the meaning behind images. Internal links. So we have an entire section on links, but what I want to cover at this point is just internal links. An internal link is a link that points from your website back to a different section of your own website. It is not pointing elsewhere, and it's not coming from elsewhere. It's from your website back to your own website. This is important from a, relevance, a relevancy perspective. You'll see internal links in your main navigation when you'll have one that likely says home, one that might say contact us, or one that says about. What you're showing to search engines and to humans is that this section that if you click on this link will be about our company or this will be a place where you can find contact information for us. These links are not votes like external links but they are relevancy metrics that are extremely helpful. When a search engine crawls and processes your website it doesn't simply look for the instances of keywords. It's a lot more complex than that. It's using a technology called NLP, Natural Language Processing. What it's trying to do is it's using algorithms to try to understand the meaning of text the same way humans do when they listen to other people talk or read, read text. Instead of just looking for specific phrases or like the order of words, it tries to extract what's behind that, what is, what is trying to be expressed here, emotion, feeling, food, anything. So when a search engine goes to your website, it may seek keywords, but it's looking for context to that. You may say, just soccer, but just having the word soccer on your website isn't going to help you rank specifically for soccer. What you need to do, and what is more common and actually happens naturally, is that you'll happen to use words like goal and World Cup and referee. Google and the other search engines are going to take these into account and understand what, that you rank for soccer or that you're relevant for that kind of keyword by the usage of other synonyms and other common words that are used within the context of a bigger, broader idea. The next on-site signal that we have is sitemaps. Now, there's two kinds of sitemaps. There's the kind that are for humans, and there's the kinds that are for robots or crawlers or spiders. The ones that are for humans are called HTML sitemaps, and you've probably seen these before. They're generally in the footer of a website, click through it, and it shows you the major sections of a website and usually provides some search functionality. Those help you understand as a human what the hierarchy of a website is. How does everything fit together, and how do I get to, the, to something I'm looking for as, as quickly as possible? Those are called HTML sitemaps, and like I said, they're generally for humans. 
There's also something that exists on the back end called an XML sitemap. Now, this is something you can actually look at, but it's formatted for computers, so it's not going to be easy to read. An XML sitemap uses a format called XML, as you can probably imagine, to show the hierarchy and the priority of each of the URLs on your website uh, so that search engines can understand that and figure out how everything is interconnected. So at this point, we've covered a lot of things that are important and things that you should be doing and optimizing. Now, let's go the different direction and, and cover the things that you should not be doing. So these are the list of the most common mistakes that I see uh, that should not be done for a well-optimized page. The first one is keyword stuffing. So back in the day, it used to be helpful, and again, this is in the past, it's not true anymore. It used to be helpful to put lots of instances of the keyword that you were trying to rank for on the page. Search engines, and humans for that matter, are a lot smarter about this now than they used to be. Keyword stuffing does not work. You're not going to rank better for uh, any given phrase by including it 100, 100 times on the page. So this is something that doesn't work, you should not do it anymore. The next one is hidden text. Unfortunately, I still see this one all over the web. This is when you write content that is solely for search engines, it's not for people, uh, and you'll put it, say, white text on a white background. So a search engine can see this because they're a crawler, they're a machine, uh, but humans cannot because they cannot see the difference because there's no contrast. Now, that also used to work back in the day, but it does not, and, it, and that is not a useful thing to invest your time in today. Uh, search engines can tell when it's white text on a white background. That's actually very easy to tell from a, from a uh, computer science point of view. Uh, it's, uh, th there's other ways of trying to hide things, but when you hide text, s modern search engines are most certainly smart enough to be able to figure that out. Probably better than humans, to be, to be honest. So don't bother trying to hide text just for search engines. They're going to figure it out and it's going to work against you. The next one is repetitive anchor text. So we've all read these articles where you get to a page and it just doesn't feel like it was written for people. You're reading a sentence and it's redundant. It's got lots of links in it that really don't need to be links. It's it confuses the way the flow of, of the information on the page because you put links when they're really they're not necessary. This also used to be a tactic that used to work but is no longer helpful. Search engines, the uh, natural language processing algorithms they used have advanced significantly so they can tell when something is not readable, when something is probably intended for machines and not for people. So do not waste your time on redundant links and trying to, trying to sculpt your page rank or your, your link equity or the value of your links anyway like that because just today's world, it does not work. The last thing that we have on here is cloaking. Cloaking is the idea of showing one thing to search engines and something entirely different to humans. Now, this is also, like everything else on the list, something that used to work. But as I've mentioned before, search engines, have, their algorithms have gotten much smarter and much more clever, and they can almost always figure out the difference between when you're doing this, if you're showing one thing to search engines and something else to humans. With, a, with only a few exceptions that I know of, which are in the process of going out, there's no reason to do this. So it is not something worth investing your time in. Now we've covered all the most important on-page optimization factors. Let's take a look at what the theoretical perfectly optimized page would look like on the internet. Now, there's a big asterisk here in that, well, no page would be perfectly optimized because the internet's dynamic and fluid and things change all the time. But if there was one, it would look very eerily, eerily similar to what we're about to talk about. Let's start with the basics. You need to have a title tag. The title tag needs to have optimized keywords in it, cl preferably closer to the beginning of it, and it needs to be clear and enticing for users to click. Remember, this is what we're going to actually see in search results for most of the time for, your search re for, for the search result itself, is you're going to have this text here. So a clear and optimized title tag. The next thing is an enticing meta description. Now remember, meta descriptions are not used for ranking purposes, but they are tremendously important for click-throughs. Uh, so this is, the, this is your chance to write copy that's going to entice people to click through your result rather than the other ones that are going to be on the search result page. After that, we have a short, optimized URL. So the important here thing here is that it needs to be short, so it's easily shareable, so it's easy to understand from a search engine perspective, but it also needs to contain the keywords that you're trying to rank for. Uh, so keep it there, keep it in plain English, use the phrases people are actually using to get to your site, uh, but keep it as concise as humanly possible. Now let's talk about the page itself. Uh, what does this actually look like? How are things structured? Well, the first thing you want to do is you're going to want to make sure that it is structured in the same way that people expect to see websites, meaning there is a title at the top if it's appropriate. There's some kind of navigational elements around the site. Uh, there are pictures to make this um, worthy of me to spend the five minutes of my internet time uh, grazing and looking at your content. And you need to have text that is well written, 
and this all, all is very hard to quantify, but it's things that you're going to just take a look at and, and work with your team for. Things that are interesting, there's an attitude with the page that it has some kind of opinion, it's expressing information, it's giving me the answer to whatever question I may have. Uh, you need to make sure this content, at the end of the day, is written for humans. This is something that I would share with my best friend because I think this is the single best source on the internet for whatever my information need is at that moment. After that, it needs to be bot accessible. So I actually see this problem all the time uh, with some of the major news publications in the world. They'll have a really outstanding article or they'll have a really beautiful uh, photo gallery, but they've done it in a way where the search engines can't see it, which means that on the internet it's almost useless, which is a, which is a shame. It's sad when this happens. What you need to do is you need to make sure that you have the world's best content, which is hard enough, but you also have to make it accessible to search engines. So this is certainly very doable. Just avoid technologies like Flash and, say, Silverlight, and use more of these open standards like HTML5. That'll get you all the way there. The next one is social. It needs to be social and it needs to be shareable. So I had mentioned the my um, when I'm trying to create content that the bar that I tried to rise to is that it is shareable for my best friend. Well, you need to facilitate that sharing. You need to have some kind of way for them to actually share it. So this could be as simple as adding uh, the social sharing buttons, or it could be something as easy as enticing them and giving them a call to action at the end of the article to share it with their friends or share it with people who are important to them. Uh, sharing on the internet is extremely important, not just for ethical reasons, but for marketing reasons, for bottom line reasons. Uh, so make sure that you're facilitating that. The last one, and it is certainly not the least important one, uh, is multi-device ready. So I don't care if you use adaptive design, I don't care if you use responsive design, just make sure that this content that you've spent so much time crafting is going to work and is going to be consumable easily on my tablet and on my phone and on my gigantic TV and all these other devices so that when it comes time, when you finally earned that person coming to your website to consume your really wonderful content, that they're able to see it on whatever device it may be holding. So, this is a general overview of what a perfectly optimized website would look like. Now, remember, this, this is going to shift depending on context, but make sure if you cover, to cover all of these bases so that the signals that we've all talked about make sense and you have a real lasting impact with this. The two broad categories of ranking signals are popularity and relevancy. Of the on-page factors, title tags are the most important individual field. Header tags are important, but less so than they were in the past. URLs are important and should be semantic. Alt text is important for search engine as well as for blind humans. Avoid keyword stuffing and link sculpting. You should always avoid keyword stuffing, hidden text, repetitive anchor text, and cloaking. Natural language processing is a technology that aims to understand the intent and semantic structure behind text written by humans. Hey, want to become an expert in digital marketing? Then subscribe to the Simple Learn channel and click here to watch more such videos. To nerd up and get certified in digital marketing, click here.